It's official. All the blood of all the people in the Ukraine that has been shed after the second month of the war belongs firmly on the hands of our own Boris Johnson. As Zelensky's deputy makes clear that they were ready to sign a deal with Russia until Boris Johnson ordered them to fight on. And the deal available now is nothing like as advantageous as the one that was on the table then. And it's official, as I predicted here last Sunday, that the ceasefire will have to be extended because Joe Biden has called on Netanyahu not to resume the massacre, the genocide in Gaza. Of course, if Netanyahu refuses, that too would open up an interesting new set of avenues. Meanwhile, Israel is murdering in the West Bank at an increased rate. It's bombing Lebanon. It's even bombing the oldest city in the world, Damascus, in Syria. Well, you've got to find some work for idle hands, said the devil. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night here on the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Perfidious Albion's footprints are oftentimes to be found in grisly and horrific conflicts around the world. But when the history of the proxy war against Russia fought over the dead bodies of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians comes to be written, I'm afraid that the palm prints of our then Prime Minister Boris Johnson are now indelibly etched amongst the bloodshed. It was said to be a Putin talking point, a trope. Some of us got Russian agent stamps on our profiles on Twitter for pointing it out. Manila Chan, my former colleague on RT America, is just one. The reality is, it's now confirmed by none other than Zelensky's own right-hand man, the man who was in charge of the negotiations in Turkey, that a deal, a much more advantageous deal than could be dreamt of today, was on the table from Russia. Essentially, all it meant was the recognition of the Minsk agreements that everyone signed up for back in the day and an ironclad, copper-bottomed pledge that Ukraine would never join NATO. For that, all these hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians' lives could have been saved. All the hundreds of billions of dollars. Russian dollars, yes. Ukrainian dollars, not so many. Your government's taxpayer dollars, an almost unlimited amount, could have been saved. All that blood and treasure was expended because, presumably, under orders from uh, genocide Joe Biden, Boris Johnson went to Kiev and told Zelensky not to sign the deal, but we fight on. Well, they're not fighting on now in Advika. A huge number of Ukrainian soldiers have just this evening surrendered to the Russian armed forces that now completely surround them, opening up the whole of the front to an advance from Russia, which need not stop, as Colonel McGregor just put it this evening, until they reach the Polish border, although I have no doubt they have no intention of doing that, but there will be nothing to stop them from doing it. We fight on, said Boris Johnson, ready to fight to the last drop of somebody else's blood. In this case, a very large number of Ukrainian poor bloody infantry whose lives have been sacrificed by a satrap, albeit a bloated one, with a fine sense of himself, as Winston Churchill, in fact, he's not fit to polish Winston Churchill's boots, Boris Johnson, carrying out the orders of genocide, senile, demented Joe Biden, 
has ensured that this terrible conflict has dragged on and on, though not for much longer, if I am any judge. And I judged correctly on the last show on Wednesday that it would be unconscionable, impossible for Netanyahu to resume his crazed, unhinged, genocidal assault on the largest prison camp in the world, as our Foreign Secretary David Cameron called it back when he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain speaking in Turkey in 2011. He said that it was the world's largest prison camp and it must not remain so. If that was true in 2011, all these years, more than a decade later, it's even more true. The depredations of living in such an open-air prison camp have been considerable even before the assault that will live forever in infamy was launched by Netanyahu on October the 8th. There's something about its quantity, to be sure. 20,000 dead in 50 days is a very considerable casualty rate. If you scale up the population, the Gazan population is 2.3 million. 20,000 dead out of 2.3 million. Do the math. Think of what that would mean in your own country. The scale of it is something to be sure. But the quality of it, if I can use that word, is what will write it in blood into the history books. The slaughter of more than 10,000, nearer to 13,000 women and children amongst that number of 20,000 is what renders it completely unforgivable and completely unforgettable. And if this cap wears it, if this cap fits, wear it. If you are among those who support it, this genocide, if you supported this Herod-like massacre of the infants, if you refused to demand a cessation to this mass murder, then you deserve to be damned for eternity on the judgment day, a judgment that will be made not by me, but by the Almighty. But I am in a position to say that if you are one of those who supported this, who refused to oppose it, who remained silent about it, who walked by on the other side of the road as the children lay dying, you are damned in this life forever. Your actions or your inaction will hang around your neck like a lead weight like uh, the proverbial albatross around the neck of the mariner forevermore for the rest of your days. No one will ever allow you to show your face, to make a comment, to condemn anyone for anything without reminding you and everyone who will listen to them that you are complicit in one of the most horrific crimes in modern history. That's how bad it was. But I said on Wednesday that the rising tide of nausea across the whole world, now finding mouths out of which to be evinced, like the Belgian Prime Minister, like the Spanish Prime Minister, like the Pope, who said this is not war, this is terrorism. Like the leader of the United Nations, hundreds of whose employees have been slaughtered by a member state of the United Nations. But not yet the British government. Even more damning, not yet by the British so-called opposition. Keir Starmer is still refusing to call 
for a ceasefire, a cessation of this slaughter. Not yet from the European Union that daily, daily was on its feet denouncing Russia over Ukraine for crimes, not one hundredth of the crimes they have been silent about over this last 50 or so days in the genocide in Gaza. No one word can be divined from von der Leyen, from Borrell, from the European Parliament. None of them have even now found voice, but the public are voting with their feet and you know, the knowledge that one is to be hanged in the morning concentrates the mind wonderfully. And Joe Biden is to be hanged less than 12 months from now. More than 80% of his own voting base demands an end to the slaughter. The American people are out on the streets in every major city in unprecedented numbers in London in unprecedented numbers, everywhere in the world, in unprecedented numbers. There will be no glad, confident morning for Zionist propagandists again. They will never again be permitted to take their high ground and lecture the rest of us on what racism means, on what genocide means. Genocide meant the Holocaust in the 1930s and 40s by fascists in Europe against millions, tens of millions, six millions of them Jewish people, ruthlessly annihilated with the intent of total extermination. That's a Holocaust. But it's also a Holocaust what's happening in Gaza. The attempt to extirpate, annihilate, remove from the face of the earth a genus, a type of people in total, not just bad ones, not just kind of middling ones, leaving only the good ones, no. The intent is now clear to render Gaza so uninhabitable and to kill as many, particularly childbearing women and particularly children who will never now grow up, to make the territory so uninhabitable that the people are forced to accede to their demand that they should remove themselves from the face of the earth or be exterminated. Exactly the tactics of the perpetrators of the Holocaust in Europe of the 1930s and 40s. There's no getting away from that. There's no getting away from the comparison between Netanyahu and his gang in power increasingly precariously and those who committed the Holocaust. And yet the former doctor of this very show, the mother of all talk shows, was arrested by the police in London yesterday and held for 24 hours for making a comparison which is as plain as a pike staff, which is obvious to anyone Gaza is the Warsaw Ghetto. The people raising it to the ground and everyone in it are the fascists. No one with eyes to see is in any doubt about that. But Dr. Ranjit Bra was arrested by the police over something in a book, on a bookstall. Would that you could get such attention to detail such diligence from the Metropolitan Police when you're the victim of an actual crime. 
when you're knocked to the ground, when your house is broken into, when your car is tanned or stolen, when you're, when an old lady gets knocked down in the street, would that the police had the time and numbers available that they have to walk down Whitehall going through people's books on their bookstalls. They even arrested two ladies for having placards written in Arabic. It has become a crime. Arabic has become a crime in England. Two ladies were arrested for holding a placard up. The cops asked them, what does that say? Like that's the big issue in Britain today. But they were told what it said. But because they had no translator, they arrested the two ladies. This farce is, of course, the legacy of Cruella de Vil, our erstwhile Home Secretary, continued by James, not so cleverly, sacked from the Foreign Office, shuffled to the Home Office, but no change of orders there. The British government is making a fool of itself and a fool of us because they are doing all of this, flying almost hourly from our military base in Cyprus, which we used to run as a colony every single hour from our base in Cyprus to Tel Aviv in giant military helicopters, the contents of which even members of parliament are not being told, their questions refused. By implicating ourselves, the Americans, by implicating themselves, the European Union, by implicating itself in a crime that will live as long as the Warsaw Ghetto itself, that will live as long as the memory of the Holocaust itself, by willfully implicating ourselves in this crime, we have made the entire world hate us. And half of our own populations hate their own government with a vitriol which is frankly dangerous. It's dangerous to our health. It's dangerous to the health of our democracy. Fast being shredded in front of our eyes. Now, of course, the devil finds work for idle hands. So, as they've been stopped, although not entirely stopped, as uh, the brave Alex Crawford of Sky News has been the best witness, they're still murdering people in Gaza, but at least the bombing has stopped. Or rather, it has moved. They are killing, I think it's 25 people in the last two days in the West Bank, where there's no Hamas, where President Abbas, their friend, is the ruler. They're murdering people. Dozens in two days in the West Bank. Settlers and soldiers are burning and looting and trying to stampede the population to what Geert Wilders, who won the Netherlands election this week, as I was the first to reveal in the show on Wednesday, he's quite frank. Jordan is Palestine, said Wilders. There is no Palestine. Ergo, there are no Palestinians and they must be driven into Jordan with incalculable consequences for that desert kingdom. And they're bombing Lebanon. 
and they're even now bombing Syria. This evening, they bombed the international airport in Damascus. Can you imagine if Syria bombed the international airport in Israel? Well, that's what happened today. And you needed me to tell you that because not one single Western media outlet will tell you that, has ever told you that. It's never glad, confident morning again for the Netanyahu gang in Israel. The question is, will it ever be for those of us in the Western countries dripping in blood who have facilitated him? Fasten your seatbelts. It's the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Abdel Bari Atwan from Gaza itself, writer, commentator, editor in chief of Rai Al Yum, doesn't need any introduction to the viewers of the Mother of All Talk Shows. He is the one and only. Let's hear from Abdel Bari Atwan. Abdel Bari, uh, the President of the United States has called on Netanyahu uh, to extend the ceasefire. Do you think that Netanyahu has any choice but to accede to the president's wishes? Well, I hope so. You know, Hamas, uh, which considered uh, in the eyes of President uh, uh, Biden and uh, Netanyahu as another uh, Daesh, as they call it, you know, they were actually... Uh, uh, expressed their wish to extend this truce for another week, another two days, uh, another whatever. So they are willing to negotiate, they are willing to actually uh, uh, extend, not only for two days or one week, maybe a month or so, in order to save the lives of both sides, the Israeli and the Palestinian. But the problem is, uh, I have my own doubt whether Netanyahu will listen to his master, Joe Biden, in, in Washington. It, it, is, it is a question mark here. The Americans are involved in this war. They sent 2,000 Marines to Gaza or to Israel to fight the Palestinians there. Israel cannot uh, or pretend it cannot uh, protect itself, so they need the American help. They need the American uh, warplanes. They need the American, uh, you know, uh, arms, everything. So I hope, I hope this actually truce will be extended. Our people suffered a lot. More than 15,000 innocent civilians were massacred by the Israeli warplanes. Well, more than 35,000 to 40,000 of people are injured. And they don't find hospital to be treated. The hospital run out of all medical uh, materials. So doctors actually used to uh, practice uh, uh, operations on their actually injured people by the light of their mobiles. So this is this is the you know the Israeli who pretend themselves are the ambassadors of the Western civilization in the Middle East, the only democracy on the Middle East. Only democracy actually is bombing hospital. I read the history very well. I never seen that a war يعني, or um, any any part of a war bombing the hospitals, killing the the the. Um, uh, ill people and throw them out of their incubator so this is this is the the problem we are facing we and you you, you george you to call gaza strip is a cage you used to call them as you know for 17 years they are actually uh, a blockade imposed on them and they don't find the simple uh, elements of decent life or decent food. I'll give you one example. I lost at least 25 to 30 of my families in Gaza. They were bombed and we don't know where, where are they. We can't find a lot of their bodies, maybe under the rubble. So, yeah, and, and also all, all Gazan people are losing their, their friends, their members of their families, their cousins, their nieces. Their, so this is the, the problem. And the prompt, nobody is paying attention for this. Nobody. And I'll give you one example. And I hope your people, you know, I have a cousin. 
he got at 50 people in his house, which is three bedrooms, and one only one actually toilet. Imagine that if you can, yeah, you can see, and there is no uh, electricity, there is no water, nothing at all. You know, there is no food for children. Children spend all the night crying because there is no food for them. And you know, the warplanes actually always in the sky and waiting to bomb. And imagine that the F-15 when they break the the, yeah, the atmosphere there. Oh, then imagine that they are horrible. The, the the sound, the horrible sound there. So the children are frightened, scared to death because of this. And the the Israeli now saying, no, we will go back and we will destroy Gaza. We will destroy until we Hamas actually completely destroyed. No, then the past they said to the Gaza, go to the south. If you want to save your life, go to the south. Now they are preparing to bomb the south, to the, bomb them in south. They don't want Palestinians at all in Gaza. They want to take Gaza because of its oil. There's and gas there. There's a huge uh, wells of uh, gas and or reserves of uh, uh, oil. So they want to kick the Palestinians out and take Gaza. That's that's their plan. And also, you know, you mentioned George. Thank you very much. You mentioned the West Bank and the massacres the Israeli committing in the West Bank. And we know that there is no Hamas in the West Bank. And despite of that, that at least every day there is 10, 20, sometimes more than that, killed by the Israeli. Why do you kill them? They kill them, and especially people in the refugee camps like Jenin, like Balata and Nablus. So why, why they are doing that? Because they want to transfer them to Jordan. They want actually to send them to Jordan, as you mentioned, you know, because the Israeli consider Jordan is the Palestine. There is nothing called Palestine. So the situation, honestly, is so bad. And I'm really, you know, I can't talk well, to my friends because there is, or to, uh, to my family, there is no internet. Yeah, the, the, it is rarely to have maybe half an hour or to, to 50 minutes, 15 minutes of the, the telephone uh, or internet so they can call us. This is the problem. And I don't, you know, honestly, when they call me, I feel scared because it will be bad news. They will tell me your cousin there is killed, your niece there is killed, you know. So this is the problem, always bad news and the destruction of Gaza and to continue. You know, 50% of the Gaza house were destroyed by the Israeli war plane. 50% of them. And, you know, the people, they, they don't have, you know, the, 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 the equipment in order to dig and save people, even the bodies under the rubble. This is, imagine that, they cannot see their loved one and their bodies, and they cannot actually stay in hospitals. Have you seen see, uh, 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 anybody bombing the hospital, a Shifa a hospital? They said Hamas has, you know, uh, uh, tunnels under the, 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 the hospital, and they bombed it. And after that, uh, uh, Ehud Barak, the Israeli prime minister, said, no, it is not Hamas which is the tunnel under the hospital. We, the Israeli, did it. So imagine that a lot of lies, a lot of actually, uh, a lot of uh, propaganda in order to dehumanize the Palestinian, not only Hamas, but even, you know, civilian Palestinian. No, so it is, it is actually a very, very drastic situation. Uh, brother George. The, the, the political program of the ruling party, the Likud party, is <clears throat> from the river to the sea. That phrase that uh, gets you arrested in, in many countries, including <clears throat> our own, uh, from the river to the sea is their policy in their party program. But they mean from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea is all theirs. Now this has found a powerful new ally in the winner of the Netherlands general election, Geert Wilders. Uh, this is obviously good news, and uh, it's quite rare for Netanyahu to get any good news, but he now has an ally, uh, the victor right in the heart of the European Union. How possible would it be for the West Bank, the entire West Bank, to be ethnically cleansed into Jordan? And what would the consequences for Jordan be? And would they be to the advantage of uh, the Western governments, do you think? You know, it is very dangerous. This is, you know, from the river to the sea, this is smaller Israel. 
But the bigger Israel is to reach Euphrates in Iraq and also to take Saudi Arabia, part of Saudi Arabia, especially in Medina and Mecca. So this is this is their plan, original plan, those radical Israelis or the Likud who are governing Israel now and supposed to be, as I said, the only democracy on the Middle East. Now, the, the, if they, you know, I believe there are a plan to transfer the Palestinian from the West Bank to Jordan. And it is approved by the Likud party. And it is their strategy in the coming few weeks, maybe through months. We don't know yet. You know, this killing at the West Bank in order to terrorize the people and say to them, OK, if you want to live like what they said to Gaza, you know, what they said to the northern Gaza, if you want to save your life, you have to immigrate to the south. You have to go to the south and take a, No, don't you know, I'm not allowed to take anything. Just go. And, uh, and they, you know, shoot some of them in order to prove that they are serious and they're killing people. Now the same thing is happening in the West Bank. They actually want to send the Palestinians to Jordan. And the uh, Jordanian government is aware of that. I met King Abdullah in London and also in Amman uh, several times. And he told me if they transfer the Palestinians to Jordan, I will go to war. You know, I will actually try to stop it by force. This is the only choice for me. I cannot have two, three millions in, in Jordan. There is no oil in Jordan. There is no industry in Jordan. There is nothing. There is no materials. So, you know, there is no water. There is no enough water even for the Jordanians who are living now. And they have at least two million Syrian immigrants on, on, on Jordan. So he, uh, he said to me, honestly, I will go to war. I will prevent this by force. I will do my best. This is the only choice for me. So I think the Israeli are the making the whole of the Middle East, you know, in war. It's a battle and make it, to, you know, to kill people. So look what, what happened in Gaza could, could be repeated in, in South Lebanon or in Lebanon itself. They said, said several times, we will actually return Lebanon to the Stone Ages. Several, you know, the, 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 this is the defense minister, Gallant. He said that clearly. I will destroy Lebanon completely as the way we destroyed Gaza. Beirut will be another Gaza very soon. And the same thing, Amman will be another Gaza. You know, those people, they don't want, they, they don't have any morality. They don't have any sympathy. They don't, unbelievable. You know, that I'm surprised, you know, how those people, those today, the, those hostages who were released by Hamas, they were raising the Palestinian flag. You know, saying, you know, we were treated in the best way, in a very human way. They never actually harassed us. They treat us nicely. They give us enough food. They give us, uh, you know, they bring doctor to check our health. So this is this is Hamas, which is supposed to be a terrorist organization, while the Israeli, who represent the Western values in the Middle East, are killing people. And most of the people who were released by, by the Israeli, you know, women and children, they said we were harassed, we were tortured. We were deprived of everything. One of the ladies who were released, she was burned nearly to death by, by the Israeli, and they never treated her on the prison. So this is the difference. So what I, I want to say that, you know, this kind of transfer, if it has happened, it will be a war. The whole Middle East will be in drag to this war. That this, it's very seriously. Now we can see this war enlarged, you know, expanded. If Yemenis are now attacking you know, it's, uh, Israeli ships on the Red Sea, and they could close the Bab el Mandeb Strait, in, which is at the, the, in the mouth of the Red Sea. So, are the Israeli, uh, you know, uh, will be left to do this? What about the American? What about the British government? And you mentioned how they are actually attacking people who, because they raise the, 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 the flag of Palestine or, you know, the Kofiya or something like that. And they're storming houses simply because they think they are support, Hamas supporter or even, the, you know, sympathizers with, with the Palestinian cause. This is the problem. George, I've been in this country for 45 years. I came here not as a political asylum seeker. I came to work as a journalist with a work permit. You know, I never, I never imagined in my life, in 45 years of my life, that, you know, freedom of expression will be actually mopped out completely. I wouldn't believe the BBC will take this position or that Sky News or the first thing they say to people, to their guests like me, you know, you must condemn uh, Hamas. 
before you open your mouth, you have to condemn Hamas. Is, is this, you know, the other day I was invited to radio uh, a program, and, you know, there were three Israelis against me, and they kept interrupting me. When, you know, they don't want me to talk. I said to the presenter, is this a professionalism you were actually lecturing in us about in journalism? So I, I feel very sorry, Joe. Well, we feel very sorry, too. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Abdul Bari Atwan. Quick break, and then it's the former Moats medic, Dr. Ranjit Brar, fresh, if that's the word, from 24 hours in jail over a book. Don't miss it. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Now, uh, Ranjit Brar is a surgeon. I mean, I'm not making that up. A surgeon was arrested in London yesterday over what seemed to be the, the cover of a book or an illustration or a picture in a book. That means that uniformed police were going into people's bookstalls and <laughs> leafing through their books to find something they thought they might be able to arrest them for. As I said earlier, would that you could get that kind of detail if you're the victim of an actual crime in London. But Ranjit got held for 24 hours in jail, got taken off in handcuffs, a surgeon in handcuffs. Dr. Ranjit, tell us what happened and why. George, it's very good to see you. Thanks for uh, having me back on the show. Um, well, I went, like many people, George, um, to express my solidarity with the Palestinian people who, as you are covering and many people will tell you, are suffering enormously currently since Operation Alaska flood, when, of course, the Palestinian people fought back against their occupation, which is not new, but has been a 75-year ongoing massacre, genocide, displacement, forced transfer of the people of Palestine, um, which we can't go into the full history, but it's important just to say that context because whenever you see a mainstream media interview, they always start by ignoring that context and asking everyone to condemn Hamas, condemn Palestine, condemn the fight back. I, I, I don't do that. But, but I went to express my solidarity and support because the Gaza, we know Gaza Strip, is 2.3 million people, one of the most densely packed civilian areas on the planet. An area, of course, that's so densely packed precisely because they've already been ethnically cleansed once from their homeland of Palestine and put in that uh, open air prison that is Gaza. Uh, and we know that uh, the, the mass military onslaught against the people of Gaza has resulted in 15,000 deaths and perhaps uh, as many as five and a half thousand of those children. And, and, and I know surgeons, I know uh, people who are working in Palestine and have worked in Palestine. We've all seen a moving testimony, uh, a, a heart rending testimony of surgeons operating on children, life after life. They're trying to save in conditions of siege. Uh, when, you know, the, the, the chief of police, the, the defense minister of Israel can come, you know, on the screen. We've all seen this and say we're dealing with human animals. Human animals is what he called them. That it's OK to put them under siege conditions, to take away their water, their fuel, their electricity, their medical supplies, to bomb civilian areas. It's, uh, these are huge mass crimes we're witnessing. But worse, perhaps, even than the crimes of Israel are the facilitation of those crimes we've seen by the Western mainstream politicians, which in a sense we're used to, but it's never been so starkly illustrated, I think, to the working people of Britain as it is now. And there is huge mass, you know, a, a discontent, uh, a, not just amongst, you know, the, the ethnically Arab or Muslim population, but amongst the whole of the working class population. This is a traditional, you know, a, 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 a cause that has got huge support from Labour families in Britain, from the working class of Britain, from the white British working class. Uh, in, in, in addition to the fact that, of course, we have a very, you know, multicultural and multi-ethnic population. So I, like many, I, I, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Palestinian, but I, I support justice. I'm against terror. I'm against, I'm against the murder of civilians. Uh, and really, you can't call it anything but a genocide. So I went down, as I did on the 11th, 11th today. Today, it seems I've literally just been bailed, not today, of course, it's yesterday, um, uh, uh, to express my solidarity. I set up a stall. I've got some books. We, we have books. Uh, my, my father is an author, as it happens. He's written books over a long period of time on, on this struggle, one in purism in the Middle East, one specifically called Zionism, 
Uh, and it's subtitled A Racist, Anti-Semitic and Reactionary Tool of Imperialism, which is a mouthful. But really what it does is it, it documents the history of Zionism, how Zionism was implanted into Palestine at the time of the Balfour Declaration with the full support of Britain, precisely to use use it. And, and this is not my words. This is the, the words of, you know, um, um, uh, the first military governor uh, uh, that Britain installed there, in his own words, uh, his name was Storrs, S-T-O-R-R-S, Storrs. He said, I'm the first military governor of Palestine since Pontius Pilate. And he said, in his words, that Britain intended to create there in the Middle East a loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism. What did he mean by that? He meant that they wanted to create a state which would help them to colonize and loot their newly conquered territories, which of course were divided up in the sykes pico agreement after the defeat of Turkey, when all of those you know, Arab territories, including of course Iraq, um, were divided uh, and, and fell to Britain. And so this state was created and has been committing crimes since its inception. Uh, and that's the background. And, and this booklet really explains that uh, history. It also explains, amongst other things, the fact that because Zionism was an ultra-nationalist ideology, an ultra-nationalist ideology which thought, actually, that Jews were the chosen people, it's a supremacist ideology and it's a racist ideology. But it also thought that Jews could never be accepted in Europe. And it was by no means a mainstream philosophy at the time it was being promulgated. It was a marginal philosophy, but it was of use to British imperialism. And they promoted it with the use of Theodor Herzl and others, and were ultimately successful in promoting it. Um, interestingly, the first, uh, uh, the only minister of the war cabinet at the time of the ba Balfour Declaration um, was someone called Edwin Montague, uh, famous for the Montague Chelmsford reforms later in India, which has its own story, led to the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. But, but he said, you know, that this was a deeply anti-Semitic policy and he was against it. Uh, despite that, it, it went forward and it's led to a state which has constantly committed crimes, particularly from the Nakba in 1948, of occupation, of genocide, uh, uh, of of uh, expulsion of the native population and really setting up an apartheid state and is currently engaged in, in really mass war that can only be characterized as genocide. So this is the book. Um, you know, these, these, these are historical facts. Actually, the book is a collection of sources, principally of Jewish authors, academics, and even Israeli courts dealing with that, and also the Havara, the transfer agreement. So, so, so things which are historically documented fact. But what I've noted, George, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I, but there's a slight pressure of speech to get, get some information out, but what I've noted is um, that really there's a, there's a war on this information. Uh, we've seen since the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn, the attempt to weaponize anti-Semitism to make Israel, and by extension from Israel, actually British and US imperial policy in the Middle East and elsewhere, immune from criticism. Uh, I think seeing Rishi Sunak, seeing Keir Starmer line up in support, justifying the genocide, saying there mustn't be a cease ceasefire, saying that Israel has the right to defend itself when it's the aggressive party in this whole history and conflict uh, is disgusting. So I, I, I've been to express solidarity. I was arrested for doing nothing other than having a book expressing those truths. Holding, and it really is those holding truths. Holding a book. Which, holding a book hold, that you didn't even not, write. Not, not not even holding it, actually, but being being near it on the stall. But, but uh, you know, first of all, the police were fine. <laughs> and it's clear that there was, there's, there's clearly pressure from a political source, because the actual police who you see arrested me, they were very nice, George. They've been talking to me to an hour. They had no problem with me. We were having banter. I was talking to people. Then they were told, I'm sorry, we have to confiscate the book. And they came to take the book. And, and, and I've got a video of that, so I'll, I'll post that later. But um, then they went away. And half an hour later, they said, no, no, we've got new orders now. We have to arrest you. And it was a slightly surreal thing because nothing had happened. It was a, literally nothing had happened. But quite clearly, we've seen Suella Braveman and David Cameron come out and try and you know, criminalize, say that the marchers who are protesting against the genocide in Gaza are hate marchers, saying that they're anti-Semitic saying that the police should crack down on them. It's quite evident that at some higher level, there was a there was a referral and adjudication process and the, the police who had been absolutely friendly and were perfectly decent to me were suddenly ordered to go into this kind of attack mode. And, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to have your liberty taken away, but it, it doesn't compare in any way to the suffering and the heroism of the P Palestinian people who through no fault of their own have found themselves on the, the cutting edge really of, of imperialist onslaught in the Middle East. So, no, of course, but uh, have uh, you been uh, charged? So, Will this go to so, court? So, so it's a good question. I, I don't know is the answer. So I've not been charged. 
Um, they, when they arrested me, and this time they, they, they did arrest me, I mean, I, I've been arrested once before, also uh, uh, outside the Israeli embassy, precisely for a similar attack of Israel on Palestine during their Operation Castlet in 2008. On that occasion, they didn't arrest me. On this occasion, they, they arrested me, they went through the process. They said that I was in breach of Section 5 and later added Section 18 of the Public Order Act. I didn't know really what it means. It means threatening words and behavior. Then they said it was racially aggravated. And then later on, they said it's a, it's a racial, uh, it's, it's imagery, distributing imagery likely to cause racial hatred. And I've, so I've sat with them in interview. I've explained to them I'm a lifelong campaigner against racism. I'm a lifelong campaigner for equality. But what I'm here to demonstrate against are concrete crimes, which are war crimes, mass transfer of population, civilian population, siege of a civilian population, bombing of hospitals, bombing of schools, bombing of churches, bombing of mosques, genocide against the civilian population. But what's quite clear is that our government are so intent on standing in solidarity and supporting that genocide that they wish to criminalize dissent, they wish to criminalize historical facts and truth in this case. So I don't know yet the full repercussions. At the moment, they've bailed me. Uh, they haven't pressed any charges, but I will have to represent to a police station. Obviously, I will do so. I'm hopeful that they won't actually follow this through and that they will back down. But whatever happens, I won't accept it. I will, I will, I will fight it uh, for as long as I need to as part of the widest you know, cause of defending the right to free speech in this country and of defending the right of all those who want to stand in solidarity with Palestine to do so. It's not really about me. It's really about the Palestinian people. And it's really about isolating the British people from the knowledge and the feeling that they are justified and have the right to express their opinions on this issue, George. Dr. Ranjit, we're right behind you. Well done. Thank you very much indeed for appearing on the mother of all talk shows. Very good to see you again. Now, Salma Shawa from an ancient family in Gaza is not just a content producer. She's got a Palestinian fashion brand, which I'm going to ask her about because we all have to do something positive, not just stand up to what's happening, but do something positive for the Palestinians, for their nascent industry, in her case, the fashion industry. I'm glad to say she joins me now. Uh, Salma, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, I was saying uh, before you came on that uh, I used to know the mayor of Gaza, a venerable old uh, gentleman, and I used to stay in a guest house run by uh, a very, very dignified lady called Miss Shawa. That's what we called her, Miss Shawa. Uh, that's probably a part of your extended family because it's a big family. Uh, but tell us a bit about how long you have, your family has been in Gaza. Hi, thank you for having me on your show. And yes, uh, the Shawas are actually a very old family in Gaza, uh, one of the oldest. And for me, as a Palestinian from Gaza, and also even more so as a Shawa from Gaza, it's so heartbreaking and traumatizing to see what my city is going through, how it's how it's been demolished. And to think about our homes, like, for example, my house, we've had three or four generations of Shawas live in it. It's around 120 years old. We don't know what is the state of our house because it's in the north of Gaza. And my mom and dad and brother had to go to the south because um, everything is getting bombed in Gaza. And it just breaks my heart to see all these ancient homes um, get destroyed because those should really be protected historical artifacts like that is gaza's history and those homes and the city is much much older than the state of israel and seeing what's happening to my city and my people and my friends and family and losing so many people in the past 50 days has just been insane i never expected i would ever go through this or my family well, uh, it has been, uh, of course, unprecedented in scale and uh, in quality, if I can use that word. Uh, more children have been killed uh, than Herod ever dreamed of killing. Uh, more children have been killed in a shorter period of time uh, than I think anywhere in any conflict. I cannot think of another conflict in which uh, well over 5,000, and when you find the bodies that are under the rubble 
that number will dramatically increase. I don't think any children have been killed uh, in that scale, in those numbers, in such a short time ever in any conflict. Uh, ditto the uh, murder of women. And of course, men. We shouldn't forget men who are the fathers, the husbands, the brothers, the sons uh, of these women. Uh, so uh, it's it's been unprecedented in that sense. But of course, it's been the reality. I, I was taking convoys of aid into Gaza as long ago as 2008. Uh, this has been a siege accompanied by periodic uh, massacre uh, all of that time. Yes, and um, I keep thinking, I'm only 26 years old, and I keep thinking about how I have literally been doing this. I've been talking about Palestine and Gaza in particular since I was a child, since I was 11 years old in 2008, uh, around the time when the blockade started, Israel bombed our high school. It was an American international school. It was providing a stellar education and Israel saw it as a threat. So they bombed the entire thing and it was never rebuilt because no one wanted to invest in a school that could get bombed because that school was expensive to build and maintain. And that's how I learned English. And fast forward to now, to 2023, I see why Israel would bomb such a school. It's because they don't want Palestinians to be educated, but we keep proving to them time and time again that we will remain educated and that we will be the agents in how this narrative is told. And I am just like all the other people in Gaza who are trying to tell their story on their phones, all these journalists that you're seeing, um, some of them were in that school that was bombed in 2008. And did that stop us from advocating and from getting an education and from always representing our homeland? No, it didn't. And the proof is today. We're speaking up about the genocide and it it, it actually feels crazy that we've been doing this for so long. I'm only 26 years old and I've been doing this ever since I could remember. And I have a feeling that we will still have to keep doing this um, to bring more awareness and and pressure governments. Now, what's your uh, expectation? Uh, Biden has uh, called on Netanyahu to extend the ceasefire. Uh, Abdel Bari Atwan was not at all confident that uh, Netanyahu will accede to this request, and even by extension of the sincerity of Biden's request. What's the feeling in Gaza about that, do you think? I honestly think that no one can predict what Israel will do next, whether they will give us more days of a ceasefire, whether they're going to say four days is enough, uh, we've seen how barbaric they have been with us for 50 days and they have broken every possible rule. They have done things that were beyond our expectation, even as people from Gaza, who all of us have experienced bombardments and we've all uh, lived under Israeli aggression time and time again. But this time they have surpassed any boundary. Even doctors are not protected. No one is protected. You Hospitals, churches, mosques, nothing is, they haven't left anything untouched. So people in Gaza don't know what's next. And we don't necessarily feel like we can buy into any empty words from any governments, uh, including Biden's government for sure. Um, so in in that terms, I, I don't even have an answer. I, I don't know. I don't know what's next. I have no idea. Now, where can people follow your uh, content? Uh, what's the best way for people to support your work, Salma? I post uh, content very consistently on TikTok and Instagram. And my uh, account name is Anat International. It's A-N-A-T and then International. Um, I'm sure you'll find it when you search. But... That's how most people have been supporting my content and learning about Gaza and staying up to date with the news uh, and what's going on there.
Now, my house is half full of Huda cosmetics, of whom, of which I had never heard before. And as goes without saying, none of these cosmetics are for me. But luckily, I have three daughters and a wife. Uh, Huda Cosmetics, an Iraqi woman, uh, her products have been victimized uh, in many places because she has stood up for Palestine. Now, you have a fashion brand also called Anat International. Tell us about it. So I started the brand a few years ago in Gaza, and it's a project that I started with my mother because she's very artsy and loves uh, traditional Palestinian embroidery. So our idea was to work with denim factories in Gaza. And the textile industry in Gaza is very limited because of the blockade. So we worked with one of a f very few denim factories in the Strip, uh, started producing denim jackets, and then we would take the plain denim jackets to an embroidery center and have women from Gaza embroider on the backs of the jackets. And we were selling them abroad. I currently live in Boston, so that helped a lot. My family would ship me the products and I would uh, sell them to people in the U.S., in Europe. But because of what's happening in Gaza, the uh, brand, we're not operating because for obvious reasons, there's no shipping and people are getting bombed. Everyone's displaced. As I said, because of the scale of the bombardments, I don't even know what happened to the factory, to the factory owners. I haven't been able to get in touch with people that I know, uh, barely getting in touch with my parents. So it's been very tough on all of us. Thank you for that. And uh, of course, one prays that the factory will reopen and that we can all buy your denim jackets from Gaza. Salma Shawa, thanks for joining us on the mother of all thanks. talk shows. You say you're only 26. You say you're doing what you can, but the eloquence of your explanations, your descriptions of what's happening would pierce the heart. Thank you for it. Uh, let's uh, take a quick break and then another young woman of note, another powerful commentator, Lynn May, coming up right after this. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Lynn May is a legal professional and a political commentator, and I think formerly a member of the Labour Party. In all of these contexts and uh, all of these uh, positions, or former positions, I thought I'd like to interview her because I've seen her on television and thought that she was absolutely terrific. Lynn May, uh, welcome uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, Let's start with the issue of race, because I've been searching for a reason why uh, some of the loudest voices, foghorns, for freedom of speech, against snowflakery, against the cancel culture, against bannings, against no platformings, have suddenly become transmuted into some of the most savage advocates of precisely those things. And I'm finding it impossible to conclude other than this is because of race. It's because they hate Muslims, Arabs, people of color, people of the global south, and most importantly, they hate them being here. And when they have the temerity to come out on a demonstration in support of the Palestinians, well, that's just too much for them. And off the deep end, uh, they go. What's your take on that? Well, to be honest, uh, I'm quite frustrated in all honesty, because I have for a long period of time now supported, advocated for freedom of uh, speech, expression, and uh, post me being in the Labour Party, I actually found what I would call almost like a solace, uh, a place within 
uh, British conservatism, uh, reason being because it was so refreshing. I found that people within, let's say, British conservatism, they advocated the most for freedom of expression, for freedom of uh, speech, which I'm a great supporter of, until it came to discussing things that they may not agree with. Now, I thought freedom of expression had to be consistent and it was for all, not only when it suited one demographic of people. So when I became quite vocal or questioning, wanting to learn more, but also seeing some of the inconsistencies, for example, with Ukraine and Russia, I was quickly shut down. This is not something you can speak about. And I thought, hang on, this is coming from the same people that advocated, I thought, for freedom of expression. Uh, the same with now we can see with Palestine. I'm having multiple questions surrounding uh, Israel, the plight of the Palestinian people. I'm wanting to question, you know, do Israelis really support Benjamin Netanyahu? Why are there different views and opinions when it comes to Muslims uh, versus uh, Jewish people? Even if we look from a religious context of some of the criticisms towards uh, Islam, looking at the Quran, which I understand why people would critique. But then when I started to query and question the Talmud, the Torah, oh, you you can't speak about those things. That's anti-Semitic. But Islamophobia seemed to be OK. So I started to query, is freedom of expression, is freedom of speech, is it consistent or is it only because it benefits them when they want it to benefit them, if that makes sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and it means that they are hypocrites with a capital H. I could name names, but I won't because you're on the screen. I don't want to embarrass you uh, by association. But uh, if you say, for example, that the Ukrainians have an absolute legal and moral right to resist with arms, in fact, you'll even give them arms with which to resist, uh, someone who's come and taken their territory, but you describe any Palestinian who does that as a terrorist, then hypocrisy is not really strong enough a word, is it? Exactly. And I, I am really um, big on the meaning of words. I'm big on the meaning of words. And when I was actually querying and questioning, say, for example, the word terrorist. If we look at just the Cambridge Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary, a terrorist or terrorism is a person or a state that intimidates, has violence towards civilians for their own political gain. So when, again, I put out a, a question to people, why can we not call what the IDF are doing terrorism? Why, why is it always that the Palestinians are framed as terrorists. And we can see that anyone who wants to support the plight of the Palestinian people, anyone who calls for a ceasefire, all of a sudden we are complicit in the support of Hamas. Now, I would have thought that Jewish people across the world, Israelis, would like to seek truth. So I'm really mystified as to how they can allow, knowing that many of them live alongside Side Palestinians, how they can allow when people say we are supporting Palestinians, that they brandish that as supporting Hamas when they know that there is a huge difference between Hamas and the civilians of Palestine. So again, I'm absolutely mystified as to how the meaning of things has been lost in this debate. And I feel that uh, coming from the supporters of the Israelis or the Israeli government, they are not actually seeking truth because it's now making them look disingenuous. It's making them, when they have certain things such as evidence, which the IDF have had to remove on a number of occasions, there's never any criticism, criticism towards that. And it confuses me. Well, uh, it's Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? Words mean exactly what I determined that they mean. And moreover, they can mean one thing in one context and a totally different thing in another. One thing at one time, but a totally different thing at another time. I said I wasn't going to name names. I'm still not. But if you look at the, the GB News crowd, for example, who were forever telling us that 
people of their political stripe were being uh, kept off television, were being no platformed in universities, uh, were being uh, discriminated against, were being shut down, shut out. Conservative people, people on the political right, and calling the people who wanted to shut them down snowflakes when they said, your views are uh, making me feel uneasy, they're frightening me, I can't let you in the university, Mr. Rees Mogg, because I feel triggered uh, by what I think you're going to say. They mocked mercilessly all this kind of thing, and yet they are now saying exactly those things about those they, on the streets prolific. protesting for Palestine. Yeah, they are absolutely, um, they're absolutely prolific in using the race card. And I'll be honest, um, I think that racism should be called out, but I don't agree with calling everything racism, which is why sometimes I would say, come on, that's the race card. But then I also have used the race card when it comes to this idea of everything being anti-Semitic. Those same groups of people would tell groups of black people and Asian people, oh, come on, stop being so woke, stop being so sensitive, stop using the race card. But when I saw somebody say they're scared as a, a blonde and blue eyed European passing individual, to me that looks like uh, an English individual saying she's scared to leave her house. If you were to spin that round and a black person said that, they would be massively criticized for using the race card and for being a snowflake. Now, uh, what do you make of the Labour Party as a former member? I was myself a former member, but that was more than 20 years ago now. Uh, I was expelled over the Iraq war, so uh, I can scarcely remember it, uh, to be honest. But you were more recently uh, the black and minority ethnic officer in the Labour Party. What do you make of a Labour Party? that cannot even now bring itself to say anything meaningful to restrain Netanyahu's mass murder. I think that what Keir Starmer is doing is he's trying to, uh, if you like, what he would deem as trying to correct the wrongs of the Corbyn era, and he's doing it to the extent of where it is no longer even making sense. He said on an LBC interview that Israel has the right, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, to cut off water to Palestinians. Now we know that collective punishment is an international crime. It's a war crime. So for him as a lawyer as well, to have said that because he is trying to somehow, you know, or he's fearful of potentially the British Jewish community, to me, is absolutely mind-blowing. And they haven't said anything against, really, Netanyahu, even though we can see in July over 500,000 people marched against Netanyahu's administration. So I don't understand why we here in Britain, as the Labour Party, can't stand up firm and say what Netanyahu is doing is wrong. That is in no way anti-Semitic. We criticise the Chinese government when we're ready. We're able to criticise the UK government. We criticise governments all the time. But when it comes to Israel, everyone must be walking on eggshells. Now, how does that apply? When I've spoken to Jacob Rees-Mogg previously, and he's absolutely huge, not just Jacob Rees-Mogg, but the Conservative Party, one of their big policies and what they stand firm on is the rule of law which essentially means no one, no state should be above the rule of law. But we, what we can see unfolding with Israel is they seem to be above the rule of law versus everybody else. Indeed. And the question is uh, that there is no opposition to it. Uh, governments no. have often been wrong, uh, maybe usually wrong. But usually we have an opposition whose constitutional duty is to hold the government's policies to account, to subject them to scrutiny and interrogation, and if necessary, opposition. But we've now got a parliament, a one-party state in our country, two cheeks of the same arse, 
uh, on both sides of the uh, chamber in the House of Commons. And that puts us in a very vulnerable position because millions of our people think that what the government and opposition are supporting is entirely wrong, but there's no reflection of it inside the parliament. That means the death of democracy. No, it does. And if we also look at what is unfolding now, as I said previously about international, the breaking of international law, we're only seeing it now that some politicians are starting to say, you know, we don't agree with the settlers, um, you know, in those occupied states. We don't agree with what they're doing in the West Bank. And if we can see Israel actually told the Palestinian people to move from one part of Gaza to the other, the north to the south. But then we saw shortly after they started shooting people in the south. They said that they would potentially bomb civilian buildings in the south. They have displaced over 1.7 million people. And my frustration, not with the politicians only, but with mainstream media is, we have pe people like Piers Morgan who consistently request for the freeing of hostages, which should absolutely happen. But I have not seen yet anyone come out fervently to talk about 1,200 prisoners without charge held by the Israeli government, IDF, uh, for years, some of them for years, with many of them being children, many of them being uh, uh, women, and yearly they are apprehending and imprisoning over a thousand young people, many of which are under 13. We can see recently that a five-year-old was arrested. Like, how are politicians and mainstream media not even talking about a five-year-old? We are talking about a five-year-old who happens to throw a stone, one stone like many, we, many of us have children that do far worse things than throw one stone, and they're being arrested under terrorist charges. That, that's what they're being arrested under. But there is absolute silence. And again, like I've said this uh, earlier, it, it blows my mind. Well, look, I'll tell you what. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that um, Israelis are hostages, but Palestinians are prisoners. Uh, that Israelis are killed, but Palestinians die. Uh, that Israelis have children and Palestinians have teenage males uh, rather than male children. And all the panoply of double standards, double speak, George Orwell, you should be with us at this hour. Lynn May, it's been a pleasure, as I knew it would be, to speak to you here on the mother of all talk shows. Thanks for joining us. Idris is in Bolton. Let's uh, hear from him. Idris, welcome to the show. Hi, George. It's a privilege. Uh, it really is a privilege. Uh, if you were uh, to stand in Bolton, we'd definitely vote for you. Uh, my my question... Uh, my, my question's... Uh, I want your opinion on something. Uh, the, the Israelis clearly can't... aren't prepared to coexist with the Palestinians without uh, a lack of equality. Uh, they're not... Uh, the, 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 it's obvious that they can't kill two million Palestinians, nor can they drive them out, right? So there's a bit of, I, I see there being a mm -hmm. bit of an impact now. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think the ceasefire won't necessarily last, but they can't go on the way they have been for the past month. So what do you think will happen given this impasse? Uh, Will there be, is there any well, possibility? Well, uh, I think uh, I, I, I'll confine myself to agreeing with your uh, thesis. I agree with everything that you said. Prediction makes fools of us all, uh, but let me attempt it. I, I predict that the ceasefire will be extended, but that the uh, ethnic cleansing of uh, Jerusalem and the West Bank uh, will be intensified. Uh, that the bombing of the neighboring countries uh, will be intensified. And the bombing from the neighboring countries will be intensified. In other words, I believe a lower intensity massacre and attempted ethnic cleansing 
will uh, continue about the uh, massive bombardment and the massacre of 20,000 people uh, in Gaza cannot go on. And it cannot go on because it is electorally damaging to the countries that make it possible. Now, Netanyahu has nothing to lose. He's going to be swept from office as soon as it is possible uh, for that to happen. And again, he'll be replaced by someone worse, not someone better, but he himself will fall. So he may, in the short term, refuse to accept his master's voice, however croaky it is in Washington, D.C. But ultimately, Israel will have to accede to the demand to stop. That's my prediction. We'll see on Wednesday on the mother of all talk shows if I'm at least even until then uh, correct. A concerned patriot says, lovely interlude from Gayatri, bright, breezy, and a welcome, light-hearted break from the drama of world news. You're absolutely correct. I'm a lucky man. I will be back on Wednesday uh, when some things uh, will be clearer. Uh, the four-day ceasefire will be over and we'll know if the mass murder has resumed and if it has, what we have to do about it. The one thing that we can not do, never do, is to pass by on the other side of the road. The parable of the Good Samaritan must dictate our attitude and our actions. It is godless, but for those who don't believe in God, it is entirely against all moral code to walk by and abandon people who are suffering at the hands of a violent, more powerful, and more aggressive adversary. It is our duty. Wajib in Arabic. It is our duty uh, to come to the aid of the injured party. That's what dictates my attitude. And as you've heard me say before, each one of us has a conscience. I regard my conscience as my daily communion with God. But whether you agree with that or not, you have a conscience. You know when you are doing right and when you are doing wrong. Sometimes you still do the wrong, but at least your conscience has told you that it is wrong what you are doing. And all of us should follow our conscience. If you follow your conscience, you will stand with the Palestinian people as tens, hundreds of millions of people are now doing all over the world. So Wednesday, at the slightly later time of 9 p.m. UK time, uh, so that's, uh, what, 4 uh, p.m. in New York, and uh, I don't know what time in Hollywood or Texas or all the other places in the United States where they are following the show now ever more closely and in ever greater numbers. More than three million people have watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows in the last seven days. Just think about that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Thanks for joining me on the mother of all talk shows.